Well, it's a great pleasure today to be able to talk to Michael Rundle, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Macmillan Dictionaries, macmillandictionaries.com, yeah. 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 Um, who I've known for many years. And uh, you've spent a life, I think, looking at words in lexicography. Uh, so when did you begin? Well, almost uh, prehistoric times <laughs> in, in, in dictionary terms. I got into lexicography in 1980, which was just at the kind of dawn of, sort of the corporate yeah. era, or really in my case it was, it was at the end of the pre-corpus era, because I did spend a couple of years um, at the beginning of my career in dictionaries working without corpora, so right. in the way that people used to, citations you, would, you would have citation right. forms, you would look a lot at what other dictionaries were doing, and you would tap into your own mental right. lexicon and intuitions and so on. So. Um, that was the way things were done in, in 1980, but of course things changed very quickly after that. And after I'd done a couple of years uh, with one publisher, I moved to Birmingham University to the Cobalt Project. Well, that must have been very exciting. Uh, to be which there in which was, or uh, so. yeah. of course, that was. It was 80. Yes, it was 82. I think. Right. Yeah. Um, it was a very exciting time. Yeah. Um, this was when um, the first corpus-based dictionary was being developed. Thought um, through, I suppose. Well, very much no so, model. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it, it did have no model, and and that was the interesting thing about Cobill that it was it was very exciting. You were on a daily basis making new discoveries from the corpus about how words and phrases worked and so on. Um, but on the other hand, um, the, there was a sort of element of shambles about it because um, you were making it up. Because <laughs> inevitably, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it was a, it was a whole new discipline, really. Corpus yeah. lexicography was in the process of being born, and I, I worked there not for very long, just for a couple of years, and right. then moved uh, to Longman, where I, I, I was uh, uh, in charge of dictionaries for quite a long time. We'll talk about um, Longman in a moment, but mm. for you, say, when you started using corpora uh, mm. to create dictionary entries, mm. was it a particular eureka moment where you thought this was the way it should be done? I remember myself, for myself, there was a eureka moment when I thought. This is definitely the way to do the study of language, or really important yeah. way. Was there a moment for you like that with I, dictionaries? I think, yeah. I mean, you would you would be given, uh, you would be assigned um, a set of words to basically create the dictionary entry for, and and a bunch of uh, corpus data, which in those days was uh, in the form of concordances on paper. Right. So uh, printed out. We we didn't have access a dot to matrix computers, printer or something. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> And yeah, you you would start looking at this stuff, and and, and it would be kind of wow, almost yeah. almost uh, several times a day. Yeah. Um, I do remember um, a word. If talking of eureka moments, I remember looking at the word represent, and um, spotting something which didn't seem to have been covered in the dictionary record yeah. up to that point. And if you Sit down and think about represent. You just use your, uh, you know, if you introspect, yeah. you sort of think about one thing represents something else, and or people represent a constituency yeah. in Parliament, yeah. and that sort of thing. Or this sign represents um, uh, this road sign represents something yeah, or other. Or um, but what we spotted was um, what was coming through very clearly in the concordances was this example where thing people will say in newspapers things like this uh, represents an enormous breakthrough uh, in right. the conflict between X and Y uh, where represent is really just a copular verb it really means is yes. uh, fundamentally and it didn't seem to have been captured no. in, in any of the record and yet it was very striking there was there's plenty of it in, yeah. the, in the corpus right. um, and then you just think wow you know there's there's a whole not a new meaning a meaning which People have been uh, a form of the word that people have been using. Perfectly but, happily. But that just <laughs> was uh, sort of evaded uh, anyone's notice because yeah. it was just just below the level of consciousness. In, in, in a way, yeah. And of course, yeah. there's, there's so much of that. So, yeah. so uh, yeah, there were there were lots of moments like that okay. working at Cobalt. So, you, so you emerged from your induction at Cobalt and then went to Longman at what was actually quite an exciting time for Longman, if my memory serves. Yeah, well. it was. There was a lot going on there. I mean, in, in terms of uh, researching grammar and so on, and and and, and the great um, grammar books uh, done by um, Randolph Quirk, Jeffrey Leach, and so on, were, yeah. all, were all being developed at that time. Um, the first thing that I did when I got to Longman was to sort of persuade them that they absolutely had to get hold of a corpus. 
uh, and start uh, basing their dictionaries on corporate uh, data, which, you know, and uh, I mean, that sounds terribly obvious now, but it was far from obvious then. And, you know, there were discussions about the sort of cost benefit aspect of that. Yeah. Well, it will cost this amount of money. Is it really worth it? Are we going to sell more dictionaries? Are the dictionaries going to be better? Will people notice that they're better? Mm. Uh, you know, all of those questions. So it was all still quite new. And um, but anyway, we, we did we did press ahead and we, we gathered um, our own corpus I in connection with um, Lancaster University. So it was corpus that the Lancaster the Longman Longman corpus. corpus. Lancaster yeah. corpus. Longman Lancaster corpus. Yeah. You've got to get, yeah, the, get it the right way around. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we thank our sponsor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I worked on that for a bit, and then and then Longman got involved in the British National Corpus. Well, uh, that's project. very exciting for me to remember, mm. because I think it, if, <coughs> if my memory serves me well, Longman were principally responsible for gathering the spoken corpus the material. Of course, that yeah. ten million words of uh, modern British English spontaneous mm. speech mm. is still a fairly unique resource in in terms of what's publicly available to study spoken English. Mm. Though, of course. Yeah new corpora being developed all the time and hopefully we'll have a match for it at some point yeah. soon, but yeah, that's yeah, still fairly totally. unique at this moment in time. Yeah. Can you tell me a bit about how it was actually done in the House of Longwood, because it's a, an incredible undertaking. It was, yeah. I mean, the, the BNC was a consortium, as, as, as I'm sure, sure you know, um, which involved um, uh, two or three big dictionary publishers, Oxford, Longman and Chambers and then a number of universities, including Lancaster, of course. Um, and uh, the responsibilities were, w well, we were all involved in discussions about yeah. how to do it, uh, and what sort of materials we wanted in both the written corpus and the spoken corpus. But the spoken one is obviously the big challenge, uh, collecting written data. It wasn't that easy in those days, but no. it's but certainly a lot easier than collecting spoken data. And um, the, uh, as I remember, there was a, the, the way that the sampling was done um, in order to make the corpus as representative as possible mm. was that the, I think it was the British Market Research Bureau were, mm. were involved in selecting people in different parts of the country who would, uh, so that you would get a balance of uh, genders, obviously equal numbers of men and women, uh, a range of ages, and to a degree, um, and, and different parts of the country, uh, and also uh, people of different social backgrounds. Which, of course, we're obsessed with in Britain. We have to have Oh, that. yeah. <laughs> yeah, <Sadly>. class. <laughs> Very important. Yeah. Um, so uh, people went, uh, went out and collected the data. The, the, the volunteers would, would have with them, um, it, was a, it was a Walkman. Right. It's a real data technology. Terribly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Cassettes with cassette, little cassette machines with with recording devices, but the I guess the big difference from now uh, was that the um, the people who were collecting the data uh, didn't tell their interlocutors, didn't tell the people they were having conversations right. with that they were being recorded. Now they did have to tell them at the end mm -hmm. and say, well, by the way, our last half hour of conversation has been recorded yeah. and it's going to go into a corpus unless you object and I think very very few people did object but I believe that that would be probably illegal now probably difficult ethically that's <coughs> certainly yeah sure. I think getting that past university ethics mm. board nowadays mm. would be difficult uh, but still it's a, a wonderful resource uh, it was a wonderful even more precious and, as a consequence and, uh, yeah and I mean I, I wasn't uh, I was I was involved with the consortium in, in all the planning and so on but I wasn't involved in the uh, transcription and that sort of thing. But while I was working at Longman, there was a whole office of people who were sitting there with earphones on, listening to these tapes and transcribing them. Yeah. Um, and so it meant that we were able to kind of eavesdrop on what was coming through from the corpus. Yeah. And it was revelatory, really. Yeah. It, it, it was is wonderful stuff. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Other things you did at Longman, I think you were involved in the activator, weren't you? The activator was, yeah, that was a... Very a, a, closely. Uh, indeed. Uh, yeah, that yeah. was a very interesting project that uh, my boss, Della Summers, uh, who was a great dictionary publisher, yeah. and, and her insight was that um, among the community of people who are learning English, um, they were quite well served with dictionaries for uh, receptive use. You know, yeah. if you didn't know what something meant or 
how to say it, you could off to a dictionary, you could go off to a dictionary, but they were, but were much less well served in terms of language production, in terms of how do you, um, how do you say this? What's the best way of expressing this idea? Um, and uh, and of course, coincidentally, all the corpus the new then new corpus data coming through as well was was in a way telling us so much about how language works and, mm. and particularly about how meaning depends so much on context and so that thinking of an individual word of just saying well this word means that is is, is really quite superficial and yeah. when, when you're in the productive mode and you're having to write or speak uh, in a language which is not your first language you need a lot more yeah. than simply knowing that this word means that you need to know how does it fit together with other words syntactically in terms of collocations and context phraseology yeah. the right kind of context yeah. and so on and that was what the act paper was about so it wasn't a book that defined um, you know names of furn pieces of furniture or flowers or yeah. vehicles or anything like that it didn't have any of those words in it uh, it was more about how do you word, use words like advise and decide and, and believe and, and so on. So it had a much smaller headword list, something like 20,000 as opposed to say 50,000 in, right. in a regular learner's dictionary. But um, we, we went into, into a lot more detail about how, how things uh, combined and also kind of disambiguating very close synonyms so that, you know, when do you use um, clever as opposed to when do you use intelligent right. uh, and or bright or brainy, you know, you so you'd put it's those words very in, subtle in a set. distinctions, yes, and it, very it, noticeable when people get it wrong. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yes, and, and and in a lot of conventional dictionaries, uh, older dictionaries uh, created before corpora, um, the definitions were of, were often just referred to one another. You'd look up intelligent, it would say clever, clever, and, clever uh, and, <laughs> and, and, and and so on, and and and. Really, the biggest part of our job during the activator was to figure out well what are the differences between these, and and, and we needed to do that fairly systematically, mm. and and we had a kind of matrix of um, questions that were related to things like speaker attitude, levels of formality, um, what the kind of goal was of, of of using the word, why would someone choose that word as opposed to that word, and what the disambiguating features were. Uh, and that was that was a very very challenging and very interesting uh, yeah. thing to do actually. Yeah. Yeah, I learned a huge amount about language right. by, by doing that yeah. book. And after Longman, you moved on to Macmillan straight away. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, Macmillan, um, Macmillan the, in the UK there are four big um, EFL publishers, uh, yeah. which is Longman now Pearson. Oxford, Cambridge, and Macmillan. Macmillan was the only one that didn't have its own dictionary. Right. Um, so somebody at Macmillan decided, well, we need a dictionary. Um, and so I, I was sort of invited to to join Macmillan and start that whole project off, yeah. uh, and then sort of gathered together a big team of people. Yeah. Um, and we uh, we worked on the dictionary for three three and a half years, something like that. Was Mike Hoey involved in that as well? Mike Hoey was indeed involved, yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the things that we did uh, early on was to set up a, a panel of advisors, mm. uh, of which Mike was the chair. Right. Uh, and the advisors would be people who had, um, let's say, many people had a lot of classroom experience in teaching. Um, they were people who'd written course material, mm -hmm. sort of quite well-known writers like Simon Greenwald, right. Andrew Underhill, people like that. Um, and then also linguists, uh, Hilary Nessie mm -hmm. um, from Coventry was was one of them, and and Mike, as you as you say, he was he was the chair of that board, and that and that was that was very important in the development stage because you you're developing the dictionary and you're you're going into uh, in commercial terms it was a very busy market. Mm -hmm. I mean they're all very three or four very successful, very good. Uh, corpus-based learners dictionary, yeah. you know, the Coville, the Cambridge, the Oxford, and so on. Um, and so we had to figure out, well, how do, how do we do this better? Mm. Um, what else can we do that other people aren't currently doing, yeah. and so on. And I had a lot of very interesting conversations with the advisors group, and, and particularly with Mike. Mm. Um, and one of the things that we um, ended up with was a, uh, a system of um, frequency marking, which was related to the idea that um, 
some of the items in the dictionary were much more likely to be used for language reception. In other words, right. the, the, the rarer, uh, less central vocabulary. Uh, and we identified a core vocabulary of about seven and a half thousand words, which we said, well, this is the, this is the bit we're going to really focus on mm. and provide a lot of material in the dictionary entries to help people encode, to help people produce yeah. language um, using those words. So, you know, the, the commonest words in English. Uh, and Michael Ho was, was, was tremendously um, influential in developing the, the details of that mm. system. Uh, which, which is the way it works is that we we, we show all those common words in red and then we divide them into um, so you get a red head word a word mm. like decide or this or that or any of those really common words is, is is shown in red and then it has a star rating either one two or three and three star words is the 2500 most frequent words in English and then two star words is the next two and a half thousand and then the one star words are the, mm. the, the ones between 5,000 and 7,500 right. in, in a frequency uh, ranking. Um, so that was one of the, 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 the sort of unique features mm. of the dictionary. And, and it, it meant, it, it's quite interesting that now that we're all online, um, it's had certain effects for us because the way we developed it when this was a paper dictionary, therefore space was finite, it was kind of asymmetric in the sense that the, the common words got a lot deeper treatment, which meant that the, the less common words uh, had relatively uh, less detailed treatment. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps uh, you would have you know, a nice clear definition, but not an example sentence right. at, at a rarer word. We now find, of course, that we've got endless space because we're online, yeah. and so we're one of our plans is to actually beef up the, the less common words and, and provide more data for them. It's interesting you mentioned online because one thing I was going to say uh, is that you've seen several revolutions, at yeah. least in dictionary production, in, in production of the corpus, say, and certainly now the shift to online. As a sort of outside observer, it strikes me that that was sort of really be quite an exciting but also a challenging space yeah. for yeah. dictionary publishers to work in. So I guess you don't print dictionaries anymore, but you yeah. put them online that's and right. people also crowdsource dictionaries. I think mm -hmm. I've seen the urbandictionary.com mm -hmm. and there are mm -hmm. other things where people do it. If my memory serves me well, I think Macmillan have a, an opportunity for people to contribute words to their they dictionary do. too. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that's re revolutionary. Like in the past, you might have got somebody at home writing in the odd dictionary exactly, entry yeah. themselves, I suppose. Um, yeah, or someone would send a, 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 a letter to you yeah. saying, why have your this dictionary funny got word. this word in yeah, it? And okay. so on. Yeah, but so this is very different because they can directly yeah, edit yeah. the dictionary. Yeah. And you've got infinite space and you can produce things with video material, audio material yeah, embedded. Yeah, it is very, yeah. very, even from the CD-ROM world, which sort of was that sort of brief interlude mm, between mm. the internet and the printed world. Uh, so what's happening in terms of new trends in dictionary yeah, publication yeah, no, in this context? Well, it's interesting you, you, you use the word revolutions, because uh, yeah, the way I see it is there's mm. two big revolutions in, the, in dictionary making in, in the course of my career, which, and the first one most obviously was the corpus revolution and, and all the changes that that brought about. Um, that sort of fundamentally changed the way that we produce dictionaries, but as far as the users of dictionaries are concerned, the, the, the big change is the more recent one, mm. which is the migration of all those kind of reference materials from printed books to, to online. To online and, and, you know, we're still, I think we're still at quite an early stage of that, and we're still trying to figure out what the implications are. Um, and, and, you know, uh, there are still <laughs> dictionaries that haven't worked that one out. One of the, a dictionary I use is the uh, a Spanish, a big Spanish one from the Real Academia uh, Española. Yeah. Um, and they've transferred their printed dictionary online, and it's free. Um, and they've still got all these abbreviations. Right. But and now, the reason you have abbreviations in dictionaries is just because to save space, yeah. because a, a printed dictionary is a is a very clever device where it packs in a huge amount of information mm. into a small space, but the cost of that is a certain amount of um, difficulty for the user because yeah. you've got abbreviations, you've got formulas that are used for defining, which which are very sort of concise and and they are essentially driven by that need to save space. Well, that's all disappeared. Mm. Um, so yeah, on that trivial level, we we open out all the all the um, uh, abbreviations. So on, and, and we try to make the definitions um, 
uh, more helpful by by eliminating them. You know those kind of formulas that dictionaries tend to use, like uh, you define pedantic as mm. um, of or pertaining to a pedant or mm. something like that. Sounds quite old fashioned. Which is very old fashioned. Yeah. And um, and again, that that's that's a that's a space saving device, yeah. really. I mean, instead of actually explaining what the thing means, yes, this and formula. So, yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the, there used to be an awful lot of that, and there's, there's, there's to a degree in some of the American uh, um, dictionaries. Um, but yeah, as you said, this change has opened up all sorts of possibilities. The, the crowdsourcing one is, is a very exciting one, mm. actually. I think crowdsourcing in dictionaries can get a bad press because people often think of the urban dictionary. Yeah. Uh, the urban dictionary is, is kind of fun and entertaining and, and so on, but it's, it's not really where you would go if you genuinely wanted to know uh, what a word like supercilious meant yeah. or something like that. Um, it's pretty good on very up-to-date slang, but on most other things it, it's pretty terrible. Yeah. And therefore, people who observe that and say, well, you know, this is crowdsourcing business, it's a lot of nonsense. But I think that there are huge opportunities mm. there because people are... People are very engaged with language. They're very interested in language. They, they, they're interested in language change, um, and you know they they like the idea of taking part. I mm. think that's generally part of the zeitgeist now. That that um, in all sorts of areas like TV and radio, you know, the general public are encouraged to to send in tweets and to send in photos of snowy scenes in yes. their garden <laughs> if it's, it's one of those sort of yeah. days and the, the weather program will say you know send yeah. us your photos so everybody wants to get involved it's, it's a big change yeah. generally from the old media model where you know you have a, a central authority that just sort of tells everybody else what to think yeah. um, and now you know now that's changed which is good uh, as you say at Macmillan we have a we have a, a crowdsourced element which is called the open dictionary and the idea is that people can contribute their own um, material. The, you have to be quite careful with that because you you've got to it give very like clear guidelines. Some rubbish coming in. Yeah, yeah. But I think well, the quality control sort of starts with giving good guidelines, so that you know you have to explain to people that it, you can't just make words up because you like the sound of them. But what do you do if you find they do? You must have some examples. Oh, where yeah. Well, made you, a word you just up. reject. Yeah, <laughs> 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 it's, but it's well explained. You know, it, so that your word the is role of the there, there has to be the word. There has to be evidence yeah. that the word really exists yeah. and is not perhaps, let's say, just a word used in your family yeah. or something like that. So in the past, I suppose the lexicographer would explore and explain, whereas now you're also filtering other people's yeah. explorations yeah. and explanations. Yeah. So it changes yeah. your yeah. role fundamentally. Yeah, it does. Uh, but it's interesting, and we we've got. We've had some very good material in, in through yeah. through that um, through the open dictionary, and we we always use that material or look at that material when we're producing updates of the dictionary. Mm. Uh, I mean, that's the other big change that in the olden days you would get a new dictionary about once every five years because that's that's how long the whole process yeah. took. It's a standard publishing cycle, um, and you you'd go to the press and say, "Well, hey, you know, we've got this, we've got a new the edition." Press is rolling, um, yeah. but you know, now we do a new update <coughs> three or four times a year. Yeah. Um, but when we do that, we do we do have a look at what's come into the Open Dictionary, and quite a lot of that material gets, we would say, promoted from. Um, we'll reconfigure it a bit and make sure that the definitions fit yeah. our defining style. But you know, we we very much welcome that kind of input. It's almost a return to the early days of dictionaries when people could send in citations. And yeah, well, and that, that's, that's sort of that's updated by the mob names. That James yeah. Murray was, was one of the original crowdsourcers yes, uh, yeah. with, with his big citation program. Yeah. Um, I suppose before we conclude, <coughs> I should also mention that you've worked closely over the years with Adam Kilgariff yeah. and the sketch engine, uh, yeah. which I think we've introduced people to on the course. Uh, do you want to say anything about that before we conclude? Uh, yeah, no. Um, how wonderful Adam is and how yeah, great the tool is. Yeah, no, I, I, Adam and I have worked together for, for many years, and, 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 and often what, what's happened is that uh, I'll have some kind of problem, and I'll, uh, Adam's a, a much more of a lateral thinker than I am, mm. but <laughs> I'll have some kind of problem and say, well, you know, we need to produce, um, let's say, 50,000 new example sentences. Uh, for the dictionary or for some client who's asked for them. And um, we could do this manually in, in the normal way. We could employ lexicographers and 
they'll consult the corpus and they'll they'll produce this stuff. But is there a better way? Is there a way we can, um, to some extent, automate the process? And um, that particular conversation led to um, a, a new technology for the sketch engine, which was called GoodX, which is a essentially an algorithm for finding uh, the best examples. So you you look at sort of concordances. Clear examples. Yeah, you look yeah. at concordances for a word, and the algorithm promotes what it thinks are the best examples to the top of the list, mm. so that those are the ones you see first, instead of having to read 10,000 right. examples. God, that's got to be helpful. You've got, you've got 10 <laughs> that the machine thinks are the yeah. best ones, and of course the technology do doesn't always work, but it, it's it's pretty successful, and as you Good. say, what you're looking for is, is examples of uh, that are not too long, but are also not too short, because yeah. they're too short, they're not very explanatory, uh, and that they don't, let's say, contain... Yeah, pronouns are interesting. We discovered that if you've got a sentence that has a lot of pronouns in, then it's likely that it's it's there's an anaphoric reference, you know, back to something in a previous sentence which the yeah. reader can't see, yeah. and therefore the example is more mystifying. Yeah. Um, and then the obvious things like, you know, it's a good idea if it's an ex if you're looking at a dictionary example for a relatively common, uh, simple word, you don't want a really rare, difficult word somewhere in that sentence. So it will look for all of those things and uh, balance all the criteria and make a decision as to what it thinks are the best examples. And, uh, and, and that's very typical of the sort of uh, relationship that I've, working relationship I've had with Adam over the years, that I, I, I sort of tend to go to him with, with, with problems and yeah. he finds solutions. <laughs> and, and, and that has all contributed to this process where quite a lot of the um, things you have to do to produce a dictionary are now automated. Right. Now, when I say automated, I don't mean you just push a button and it happens. And there's, there's still sort of machine assisted. It's yeah. definitely machine assisted. Yeah. I mean, there, there are still sticking points. There are things like writing definitions, which is a lot harder for machines to, to get the hang of. I mean, I, I'm pretty confident that eventually the technology will be able to do more and more of this. Yeah. But, but at the moment, it does, it does, it certainly does all the drudgery. That's you know, the old Dr. Johnson quote mm. about lexicographers being harmful drudges. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, all that stuff that we used to have to do about checking cross-references manually and so on. I mean, that's all done by yeah. machines and, and that's no problem. And um, hooray for that because it's, oh, it's yeah. unrewarding. Well, it's, really, it, yeah, and it means you can sort of concentrate on what's, what's important and what's more difficult, mm. really. Um, so there's a, that interesting relationship. But the, the, the computers first did all the, the simple stuff which is great, and then we don't have to do it, it's boring, and they do it much better anyway, they don't make the same yeah. mistakes. And then, you know, increasingly doing these quite interesting and challenging things, like finding good examples to put in the dictionary. And um, that, you know, that process goes on. You yeah. know, we're uh, uh, talking to Adam at the moment about um, definitions. Yes. Well, we all have a lot to thank you for, <laughs> and Adam, and Michael, and all the people that you've <laughs> mentioned. But that's been wonderful. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks, thanks very much for having me, Tony. It's been a pleasure.